Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Daniel Theobald. Daniel is a co-founder and the president of Mass Robotics and also the CEO and founder of Mechable, among another of other enterprises. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm excited. Excited for the conversation. Me too. So I, I first found out about you uh, through your work at Vecna, and then that's kind of what caused me to reach out. Um, is it okay if I ask a little bit about that and like how you kind of got to, to where you're at? Yeah, Vecna is an amazing organization. Um, it started out uh, somewhat as a incubator slash you know R and D organization, and eventually we focused in on driverless forklifts. So today, Vecna Robotics is the world leader for driverless forklift or autonomous forklift technology. Uh, deploying those forklifts to a number of large organizations that you've probably heard of. And, um, uh, you know, I think it, it was a real thought leader in this idea of getting practical mobile robots out there in the real world in, in, in a way that's safe, affordable, um, you know, with a high R, uh, ROI, um, which means return on investment. Um, so yeah, really, really exciting organization. I continue today as the uh, chairman of uh, Vecna Robotics, um, but am not as involved in the day-to-day -day operations. That's awesome. It must be great to be able to still be influential, but kind of take a step back to focus on other pursuits at the same time. Well, yeah, it's it's really um, enjoyable to start something and see it take on a life of its own. You know, this is, I'd say, true of mass robotics as well, where, you know, it was an idea, worked hard um, uh, with some co-founders to make something happen. And then you see the impact that this organization uh, has on the world, um, you know, without you necessarily needing to be there every single day making it happen. Right. It, it's it's almost like birthing a child and that child takes on a life of its own and does amazing, incredible things that sometimes you wouldn't have even predicted or imagined. And so, yeah, it's very um, uh, fun to watch that process. That's awesome. And I'm a huge fan of mass robotics. I think you guys have an amazing space. Um, I really like it. I think it's a model for, you know, what a you know center of a robotics cluster can look like, I guess. Um, what are like what's the craziest thing that your child has done while you were you know out doing something else and you came back and you're like they built that or like i mean with respect to mass robotics i guess or maybe even any of the, the yeah. entities well no about. mass robotics yeah mass robotics is just uh, doing so many amazing things um you know the reason that uh, when when i first got the idea to build uh an organization like Mass Robotics. Um, it was actually at Vecna, Vecna Technologies, not Vecna Robotics, where we had, you know, machine shops and, and laboratories and all, all the, these exciting uh, test spaces. Because back then, you had to bring all that stuff to the table yourself. Um, you know, there were not incubators or accelerators focused on robotics. So we had to do it all. Um, and part of the reason I, I got excited about building such an organization was because it seemed to me a shame that almost all of these organizations essentially had to start from scratch. You know, when you're trying to build a robot, you had to do everything yourself. And that seemed to really be holding back the industry from my perspective. So I thought, you know, what if we could create an organization that can help accelerate or take care of a lot of this infrastructure stuff, access to machine shops, knowledge around uh, sensors and tools and and um, you know opportunities to collaborate to connections with VCs and end customers all of these things sort of um, 
you know, managed in a way that makes it much easier for the entrepreneur to, to gain access to these things. And um, it has been an absolute pleasure to see that organization grow and thrive. And I'd say the thing that almost, I'd say the thing that made me most proud was, you know, I was actually showing up to Mass Robotics uh, last year for a board meeting and uh, got in the elevator down in um, Seaport District, uh, the building there, Channel Street in Seaport District. And I went to the wrong floor and I got off and, and, and uh, you know, was walking, trying to walk towards space. And I walked into this room and it wasn't the room I was expecting to go on, but it was actually a room filled with high school young women. And they were all doing robotics. Oh, cool. And this was a mass robotics program that they had started called Jumpstart. And uh, they had, you know, just um, sort of... Uh, borrowed this room in the other part of the building to do this program. And I just accidentally walked in um, <laughs> and it was, it really warmed my heart to see this um, impact that, that the organization was having and uh, talked to somebody later on and they shared how so many of these young women that uh, get involved with this program never would have even considered robotics as a possibility. For their lives uh, possibility for their career but many of them afterwards actually choose careers in robotics that's awesome um, and that kind of life-changing impact hopefully for the better is something that's really exciting to see i mean it, it just opens up people's imaginations as to what they're capable of and i think that that is uh you know that is something that's obviously a really big positive um for so many people's lives yeah. Um, but, you know, Mass Robotics is doing all kinds of cool stuff. We're working on international standards for robotic interoperability. We're um, uh, promoting um, a, a number of different initiatives to um, make sure that robotics is accessible um, and available and, um, you know, having a positive impact in the world. Um, yeah, it's a really fun organization. If, if, if you're not familiar with Mass Robotics, please uh, reach out, massrobotics.org get involved. Um, there's so many ways to participate, at least get the newsletter. It's really fascinating stuff. Yeah. And I'll second that. It's, it's a great organization, huge fan. And, um, I'll be honest, the story you told me kind of reminded me of one. So I used to mentor an all girls high school robotics team called the girls of steel, uh, through the Carnegie Mellon field robotics center. And, um, I recently had the pleasure of hiring one of my students, Molly Urbina as a grown up engineer years later and I'm, I'm so proud to see how far she's come and you know to, to see her have taken that leap into the robotics industry and so yeah. I think it's one of those things you you sort of you get I don't want to say corrupted but you get turned on to through an experience as a kid I mean I know that was the case for me what about for you how did you end up going down this road oh. <laughs> you know I was born in San Jose California you know this was uh, Silicon Valley sort of the heart of Silicon Valley before it was even called Silicon Valley. And um, I was having a technological experience that I did not realize was completely unique to this area. I just assumed, you know, the exposure I was having to technology was happening all over the world. But, um, you know, Atari headquarters was right here. I used to ride my 10 speed around the valley. I used to dumpster dumpster dive in uh, Atari's dumpster to get <laughs> you know the QA rejected uh, game uh, game cartridges and I'd play those um, and uh, uh, you know I'd uh, go around and collect parts for my different robotics and and computer projects. I built an Apple II Plus uh, of spare parts that I found. It's awesome. Um, yeah, it was just an amazing experience and. I was just really excited about technology and particularly about the, uh, the possibility of technology making people's lives better around the world. And that theme, you know, just kind of uh, carried with me throughout my uh, career. Um, in high school, I was very fortunate to be chosen as the representative of the state of California to a supercomputing program at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. They chose one student from every state. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was, it was really exciting. Um, 
I got to work on the world's fastest supercomputer at the time there, a Cray computer called Bubbles. <laughs> and and I, it was called Bubbles, actually, because the entire computer was submerged in ultra-pure water. Oh, that's interesting, like deionized. Yeah, yeah so that it could um, you know, cool um, at a rate that would allow it to not burn up. And because it was, you'd you probably know, boil off certain components, you'd create bubbles, hence the name. That's exactly right. Um, and while I was there, I actually had the opportunity to spend a little time with Edward Teller. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so well known as the father of the hydrogen bomb. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing and, he's known and, for. Also the yeah, father of Astro. It, so. Yes, that is true as well. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because uh, this conversation I had with him really left an impact on me in terms of the responsibility that we have as engineers to think about how what we do is going to affect the world um, and uh, you know try to the extent possible to make sure that the decisions we make as engineers are a net positive for humanity um, because uh, if you look at the world around you this world was designed and built by engineers Yes, I don't want to in any way, you know, diminish the role of doctors and artists and politicians and all of those things for creating the world. But, I mean, the as-built world, it's engineers that have created this world that we live in. And I don't say that from a, from a point of pride. I say that from a point of responsibility. It's really important that as engineers, we think about how what we are doing will affect humanity and you know, try and try and make sure that to the extent possible, we are uh, moving that in the right direction. And uh, funny story, um, you know, Oppenheimer, the movie just came out not too long ago. And I had actually gotten an invitation from the Oppenheimer family to see the first viewing of it. And somehow it got messed up on my calendar and I missed it. Um, yeah which was pretty brutal, but, you know, it was interesting later on to go back and see that and see Edward Teller's role in that whole process. And, uh, um, yeah, so really, really exciting opportunities, uh, formative in my young career. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. So um, I guess what are some of the projects that are promising that are coming out of mass robotics right now? Well, one that I think is important is the uh, idea of this um, interoperability standard. So one of the things we realized early on was that, uh, you know, when you only had a few robots out there, it wasn't really that important that the robots were able to communicate with each other. You know, a robot, it was fine just uh, having one robot consider another robot as an obstacle. You know, we call things in the environment that we that we need to avoid obstacles. I mean, that was okay for small numbers of robots, but as the number of robots in a warehouse or a, um, you know, facility or in an area increased, it would become increasingly important the robots be able to talk to each other. And um, we, we got together a, uh, a team of roboticists from different robotics companies throughout the industry to start to talk about this issue. It was really interesting because at first we didn't have much buy-in. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a lot of resistance to the idea, particularly uh, companies saying, oh, we don't want to share data. We don't want to communicate with those other robots because, you know, we're special and we're better and um, we don't want to participate. And, um, uh, we got, you know, we got to the point where we convinced people that um, uh, this was an important problem, particularly the people who were convinced were the customers right? Um, I think sometimes there are robotics companies that think they're going to be the only robot at a particular customer site. That's a very naive um, position, uh, you know, just to think like uh, some company is going to, um, you know, only use your robots or your products and never use anyone else's. Um, this doesn't really work. 
So once the customers started saying that uh, they needed robots to be able to uh, interoperate and communicate at their facility, of course, then the manufacturers of those robots get m much more interested in it. And um, so we, we built the standard. And what we decided to do was to take a very agile approach to standards development. So um, agile is this concept in software development, which is about sort of breaking the old fashioned way of doing software development, where it took a year to basically get a release out and instead having a um, very rapid cycles. Um, and the reason we thought this was important was because technology is changing so quickly right now and robotics is changing so quickly. You know, if we took five years to create a standard or 10 years as sometimes is the case to create a standard, by the time the standard came out, it wouldn't be that useful. Um, so we really wanted to move things more quickly. So what we built was a very, very lightweight um, standard that allows robots to get, you know, sort of 80% of the value of communicating, um, but while keeping it super, super simple so that anyone could implement this standard, um, you know, basically in a matter of hours versus needing to invest weeks or months in, you know, to have the robot learn this new language in a sense. And um, that was uh, very successful and um, it uh, was then uh, um, sort of adopted, acknowledged by A3, uh, the Association for Advancing Automation, and then they worked with us to take this to a full international standards organization standard process. So the standard is now um, close to being approved. I think that will happen, um, if not this year, by next year for sure, as an international standard for how robot mobile robots talk to each other. That's awesome. Yeah. I, so it, I, I'm sorry. sorry I, was, I was just going to say, I like that you got actual like buy-in from the end user as a stakeholder and you went through the process of thinking, how can we drive adoption by making this simple to put on robots? And you know, yeah. it seems very considered and, and deliberate the way you describe it. Yeah. You know, I think we learned from past mistakes where, Oftentimes, especially if you get a group of engineers together, everybody wants their piece, you know, they all want it to do all these things. And so we had to be very disciplined to say, what is the actual bare minimum, um, uh, you know, that we need in this standard to make it valuable? And all the other cool stuff that we might want, we're going to just pass on for now. That can be in a future, a future version. But our goal here is to make it super simple and to get it out there fast so that people can start benefiting from it. And more importantly, so that we can start iterating on it. Because until people are actually using it, you really have no idea. Um, you know, version one of anything is uh, most likely going to change a lot in future iterations because that's when you start learning when you're actually using it. And um, yeah, it, it ended up being a, a process that worked really well for us. And um, I think it's uh, exciting to see the impact that that's having. Um, and, you know, for me, it was really satisfying to be able to watch this entire process. I mean, I remember the first moment when I, the idea crossed my brain. I was actually on a flight from D.C. to uh, Boston. And I was just thinking about, you know, sort of rolling, rolling time forward a little bit and what the issues were going to be. And I got pretty excited about it. I got off the flight. I got on the phone to Tom Ryden at Mass Robotics. And I said, hey, Tom, I think we need to do this. I think it's uh, really important for the industry. And, um, yeah, and the rest is history. That's awesome. So tell me a little bit about Twisted Fields. Oh, yeah. I love this place. So Twisted Fields is a research farm in beautiful San Gregorio, California. So San Gregorio is... Um, it's about uh, 20 minutes south of uh, Half Moon Bay. It's about an hour north of Santa Cruz. Um, grew up going to the beach in Santa Cruz. And we're about, um, I don't know, 30, 30 minutes uh, uh, west of Stanford University. Oh, cool. So basically, if, you, if you're in the um, VC world, you, you're probably familiar with Sand Hill Road. You basically get on Sand Hill Road and drive towards the beach. Uh, you know, our, our farm is uh, um, about uh, two miles before you get to the beach, or three miles, I guess. 
Um, but uh, it's a it's a research farm that we set up with this idea of um, having a a test bed for trying out agricultural technology. 127 acres, uh, beautiful giant redwoods, rolling hills. Um, uh, uh, we have grains and fruit crops and and row crops and animals. So we have all the you know, or I'd say a, a large variety of different farming and agriculture practices and products uh, because we want to be able to develop technology that actually makes sense for farmers. There are a lot of agricultural technology startups out there that I, I would have to say sadly don't really understand agriculture um, and oftentimes are either trying to automate processes that you know, are, are actually not good candidates for automation or um, solving problems that have already been solved or solving problems in an impractical way or a way that's way too expensive. So I would invite everybody who's trying to work on agricultural technology to come take advantage of the resources here at uh, Twisted Fields. Um, the, the ranch itself is called Rancho San Gregorio, um, which you can look up in Google Maps. Yeah, well, and you're always welcome to come here for tours as well to see all the cool stuff. But um, yeah, really important that uh, we don't waste our time, um, that we actually focus in on the problems that uh, real farmers need solved. One of the problems that we're working on here organically is, organically pun intended, I guess, is um, uh, we're building an open source farming robot uh, called um, PFR, the Precision Farming Rover. Uh, precision farming is this idea of um, using precise location of things you plant so that you can actually um, care for plants more on an individual basis rather than on, you know, a hundred or thousand acre basis. And uh, if you can do that cost effectively, you can significantly increase yields, you can significantly reduce pesticides and fertilizer use. Uh, prevent runoff, uh, reduce water use, et cetera. Um, and uh, the problem with precision farming is expensive. It's labor intensive. So what we're trying to do is create tools that um, allow it to be done at a practical, in a practical cost-effective way. And uh, that involves automation. Uh, our, our robot is um, uh, a tool that we're building that any farmer or company or a technologist can take and adapt to their local needs. We're sort of trying to build, in some sense, the iPhone or the Android device that other people can then build apps on. And what we're doing is solving a lot of the hard robotics problems um, so that uh, other people don't have to. So, you know, the platform takes care of uh, um, power management, navigation, safety, communication, um, you know, uh, basic, a lot of the basic algorithms to do certain things and, and some basic tasks like mowing and that kind of thing. But the idea is that uh, you can then take this platform, it's open source, you can modify it, you can add to it, you can build your own versions of it and use it to solve problems in sub-Saharan Africa or, you know, rural India or South America or wherever. Our real, one of our real big um, uh, priorities here was making it extremely low cost. One of the biggest problems I see in a lot of ag tech is that they will build really cool robots that do really amazing things and they're really expensive. And so they're uh, impractical. Um, we have been focusing on building a platform that is so extremely low cost, you know, even a modest farmer could own a whole fleet of these. And one of the cool things about it, too, is we're really focusing on environmental sustainability. So our robots um, uh, don't even need batteries. Um, they can operate directly off of power from solar panels. Um, you can add batteries if you want. You can add generators if you want. But um, in, in its lowest uh, or its most basic configuration, um, it wakes up when the sun comes up. It works while the sun is shining. And then at night it goes to sleep and um, and uh, you can um, get about twice the amount of work done from those solar panels as you would if you were going through a battery storage cycle. So it's this really cool engineering thing where 
by getting rid of the batteries, we actually significantly increased energy efficiency, but we also reduced the weight. So we didn't need to have as big as mo as big of motors in order to move these big batteries. And so it, it sort of turned into this nice uh, sort of engineering sweet spot where by getting rid of the batteries, the entire system was able to become uh, less power intensive and um, less expensive. It weighs less, so it's not compacting the soil. Um, just lots of really cool benefits. What kind of, so yeah, if you're, I, I apologize, sorry. but I was going to say, what kind of um, weight and like speed figures are you getting with that configuration? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, so it will operate at a, a fast jog type of pace. Um, this is not this particular um, robot is not intended to be used, or at least. Um, the main applications for us aren't intended to be used in what I would call high energy applications like tilling or deep ripping a field or something where you're you know putting tons and tons of energy into the soil. You know, those that's going to continue to be something that's better done when necessary, better done by a big, you know, perhaps diesel or maybe in the future electric tractor. Um, but this is for more all those other tasks, which there are a lot of them where you don't need that full power of a full tractor um, and you don't need to be running that big diesel engine, you know, spewing um, uh, carbon dioxide and other contaminants into the air. Um, they're lower energy tasks like things like weeding, seeding, crop inspection, even pesticide application, precision pesticide application, I should say. Here we don't use any pesticides um, and those type of things. So a lot of it for us has been about trying to um, uh, really figure, really bring energy efficiency into many of these farming processes, which hasn't been something that's been considered uh, very much in the past. Because, you know, in the past, you always had a tractor with a big diesel engine. And well, I think another enabling factor probably is that the solar panel technology is better now than it's ever been. I mean, I remember in the 90s, you know, you would get a square foot solar panel and you could barely power anything off of it. You know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe an led, you know, but yeah, 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 it certainly is getting better. Um, and, uh, I think one of the things that, uh, has helped out a lot, um, in these type of applications, mobile applications is the lightweight solar panels. So quite a few years ago, I built a solar powered VW bus. Oh, cool. Um, 66 beautiful beautiful bus that's the best year by the way if you ever want to get a vw bus 66 is the right year <laughs> um, but uh subjective. Um, it's super objective well that was the year before they messed it up with what they called the bay window in front so it still had sort of the pilot still sort of had the airplane split front window oh that's fun it has that classic look yeah love it but I actually didn't get a VW bus for this project because it looked cool. I got it because it was a very easy platform to convert to electric and a big, basically a big empty box that made it really easy for prototyping stuff. It just turned out that um, uh, it was also a really cool, iconic platform. Um, and you can, you can look this up on Google if you just Google VW, solar-powered VW bus maybe throw my name in there it'll come up yeah i would drive it around um uh, boston it was my daily driver for a while i actually taught awesome. my oldest daughter to drive on this bus um uh, under uh, on solar powered and um just to be clear it didn't drive full speed on solar power it would charge up batteries which is a little bit different than our robot uh, that we're running here which can charge batteries but mostly doesn't um, but we'd be driving it down the road and people would like literally stop traffic to say, that is so cool. Tell me about it. And I'm like, uh, when we're holding up traffic, let's, you know, if you really want to, we can pull over. But, um, my kids were so embarrassed by it because <laughs> we, I'd drive them to school and their friends would just be going nuts about how cool this thing was. And they're like, Oh dad, oh. <laughs> they didn't think it was that cool, but, um, I think, I think they probably do now. That's awesome. But that, I mean, that was a big inspiration, actually, for the, the farming robot, the solar-powered farming robot, because we actually figured out a lot of these things working on the solar, the uh, solar-powered VW bus. Well, and the fact that you're able to forgo batteries entirely and you figured out, you know, kind of what gearing at what, you know, 
speeds um, and payloads gets you there and you know the, yeah. you forgo the weight of the battery and like you said now you don't have to size the motors as big or any of that stuff or run them higher up on their you know their uh, current utilization curve I guess I'll call it yeah you know that's that's awesome I mean that's that's a huge deal I mean if you'd have told me you know 20 years ago that you did that I would have said you were full of crap you know yeah. <laughs> so I think I think that's People awesome do it. People still tell me I'm full of crap all the time. But, you know, it's interesting because it's just a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, thing that, the thing that's important to realize is that if you take an approach where you can't, where your robot or machine, your, your mechanization, whatever it is, is energy aware, then you can do a lot of really cool stuff that you can't do when your machine isn't energy aware. And what I mean by energy aware is that the, algorithms are actually taking into account how much energy you're utilizing oh cool so the robot will actually speed up or slow down depending on how much you know if the clouds in the sky if the cloud comes over the robot just slow down it'll adjust its rate so that it's still operating at peak efficiency even though it's getting you know less less energy in from the solar panels that's awesome so you're planning a little i mean you must need some kind of like a capacitor or something to kind of smooth yeah. that. You got it, Spencer. Yeah, it's got a capacitor on it. We use a, a fairly small ultra capacitor bank. Awesome. And it's just using, yeah, it's just using that as it's sort of like temporary holding tank. And then we actually are able to maximize the efficiency of the solar panels because they, the solar panels are, are actually connected directly to the ultra capacitor bank, nothing in between. So ultra capacitor voltage is the back voltage on the solar panels. And there's something called maximum power point tracking. A solar panel will operate at its peak efficiency when the voltage, uh, you know, when the voltage it's seeing is matched to the amount of solar, um, solar energy that's coming into it. I don't want to bore people, but long oh, story short. interesting to me. Yeah, long story short, you can um, uh, optimize efficiency by going slower or faster, depending on how much um, uh, um, energy is coming from the sun at that particular moment. One well, isn't motor speed to like power utilization a cubic relationship too? So I would think you can really, you know, see a difference by how fast the yeah. motors are driving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's. Um, uh, so many interesting things that you can do when you are power aware. That's fascinating. And, yeah, most most robots, as you well know, are not power aware. They sure, just assume pretty... they have you know forty eight volts available to me at all times, and you know if the power runs out, the robot just goes. Ah. Yeah, but if you did that with the the solar powered system with no batteries that you described, you would brown out all the time. So you have to be power aware. So. You've, you've sort of forced that type of thinking with the constraint, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and there are all kinds of benefits to it. Um, so it's one of those serendipitous things where we didn't go into it uh, with this in mind, but uh, we, we very quickly discovered a whole lot of benefits to that approach that we would have never found if we hadn't had the constraint in the first place. That's really, really cool. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.